Rita Sim. Dobrého dňa. Dobrého dňa. Dobrého dňa. Hello everyone, have a click so I can see you. Nice to meet you. Okay, I believe we can start and the rest will join us. Uh, folks, as I, as I told you previously, today we have a unique opportunity to uh, listen to our colleagues from Luxembourg Center for Contemporary Digital History. Uh, colleagues, I really appreciate that you uh, decided to join us today and share your experience and uh, skills. Uh, as I told you previously in my letter, the um, students are the first year students so it's rather an introduction to digital history just to encourage them and to introduce them to the concept of digital history and to give them general understanding out of what the uh, contemporary historians may do can do uh, with all these tools and possibilities uh students don't be shy and don't feel yourself underqualified if you feel something so if you have any issues or troubles you can just uh, uh, write down in the chat any questions and uh, if it if it will be more comfortable for you then uh, then talk uh, colleagues the floor is yours thank you one more time hi thank you so much for the invitation i will just jump right in here um, and do a short introduction also. Uh, maybe Caitlin can, shall we already share the screen? Yes, Martin, would you mind letting us share our screen so we may have a, we may share our presentation? Um, yes, cool. Yeah, so thank you again for the invitation. We were super excited to um, come up with, with a concept for this lecture and kind of give you an introduction to what web scraping actually is because it's kind of a fun way to interact with, well, the web and get data and how to be a bit like a bit more digital historian. So this is actually a fun, fun way to play around with things that you can find on the internet. Um, so yeah, data collection and web scraping is what we're going to talk today about today. Um, I'm going to introduce myself quickly. My name is Elian Schmid. I'm a first year PhD student um, working on urban studies and trying to make maps. So that's kind of my angle to digital history. Um, and Lena and Caitlin will um, introduce themselves as well. They're a bit more advanced in digital history, so they can give you more in-depth um, information later on as well. Maybe, Caitlin, you go first. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Burge. I am a postdoctoral researcher here in Luxembourg. Um, my 
interests are in network analysis. So I look at historical data and how we might reconstruct um, social structures. But I also have a big interest in sort of critically thinking about how we might collect and use data, which I'll talk a little bit more about today as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Helena Yaskov. Um, my original background is in East Asian studies. So I've studied Chinese studies and Japanese studies. Uh, I'm also a postdoc like Caitlin. I've joined the C2DH two and a half years ago. Um, and um, as Caitlin, I'm also working on the network analysis part in, in our project. So yeah, nice to meet you all. Cool. And uh, then to just um, give you a short overview of what we're going to do. Um, first of all, we're going to introduce, or rather Caitlin will introduce um, what it exactly means when we're talking about data, what are the decisions that you make concerning data, how do you collect data, just to give you a broad overview. I don't know what exactly you covered in your lecture series up to now, but it's always good to have um, these things as a basis um, in the back of your mind um, and repeat it as well, because there are many interesting questions that are connected to what data is and how to use data. Um, then I will give a short introduction to what web scraping actually is, and we can do some hands-on um, well, playing around with, with the website and the back end and so forth. We will see more about that later as well. And then I will give you a more um, broader overview of what actually web scraping is, how you can use it, how you can scrape data, and what you can then later on do with that data once you've got it away from the internet kind of. Um, and so in the end, we will use the data that Lena scraped to um, play around with graphs and visualize this data as well. So you actually have something tangible in the end. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do broadly in the next one and a half hours. Sounds good. So I will take over from, from there, if that's okay, and talk a little bit about data itself before we get into um, some of the web scraping activities um, and offer an introduction to kind of like data decisions and data collection of which web scraping is just, it's, it's, it's one mode. Um, so during, during as um, Eliane said, during your course, you might have already thought about this term data a lot, um, but it's worth quickly discussing it before we move into like actually working with it. So the official definition of data from Cambridge English Dictionary is information, especially facts or numbers, collected to be examined and considered and used to help decision making um, or used in, uh, in or, or information in uh, electronic form that can be stored and used on a computer. Um, and this sort of second one, there's an especial emphasis put on this, this digital side of data, especially when we're working in the digital humanities. It's a useful definition for us to have, um, but it also kind of hides a lot of the work that goes into creating data um, or some of the ambiguity that can often come with this term um, and what is included or not included in that as well. So Joanna Drucker has sort of argued that we should reconceive all data as capture, and this places the, the emphasis on capturing information rather than it being something that is just out and about in the world that's naturally occurring or that can just be found exactly as it is. Um, and it's important to think about the process then that comes about in collecting data. It's something that we actively select. It's something that we, we, we curate and we make um, for ourselves. And so it's important to think about all of the decisions that go into that first of all. Um, and this is the case if we are transforming traditional or archival paper sort of physical sources into a digital source or into data. Um, but it's also important to think about it when we're dealing with born digital materials, so material that has already been put into a computer friendly um, digital format. And we'll be thinking, we'll be looking at both those examples today and thinking about that more clearly. Um, so in creating data or uh, collecting capture, there are layers of decisions that are happening, um, especially if this data is what we might think of as already available, so online um, and available for what we will do later as web scraping. 
Um, so before you get to decide what kind of data you're interested in looking at and how you might collect it, uh, you need to consider also what has already been done ahead of that, what has been done for you. So if we think about digitization or dis digitalization as an example, um, and by this we mean that digitization is when you would take what is a, for example, a paper and you put it online. So you make it digitally available, um, but it's mainly only images. Um, whereas digitalization is when we create metadata out of that. And by that, we mean that you transform it into an object that you can use for digital analysis. So you make it into data that you might uh, make graphs with or code with or do something more with, so two different layers. And we'll see both of those layers um, in a second. But when either digitization or digitalization happen, um, a series of decisions have already been made about what format they should appear in, what parts should be transcribed or digitized, and what has been pre-selected or filtered before you get to it. So what has been made available for people to use? And those decisions have also been made about how to handle or present missing or incomplete data. Um, so more traditionally, the further back you go in history, the more likely it is that you are missing data or you're dealing with incomplete sources. And it's important to think about how those before you who have presenting you this data have already made decisions about how or whether or not these, these, uh, these kind of data should even be included. And again, we'll see examples of all of this when we move on to some of our web scraping, but it's important to think about these questions all of the time when we are approaching digital sources. And all of these kind of questions build into a general question of how do we trust information? So we're used to historical source criticism, if you've done work in history um, before, um, where we evaluate who produced the information and what they might be emphasizing or trying to hide. And whenever we deal with primary sources, we commonly ask these kind of questions. Um, but there's a general tendency to think of numerical and quantitative data as fact. It feels more solid. It feels more definitive when we're dealing with numbers as opposed to, say, a cartoon or a report or something like that. Um, but actually, those kind of core criticism and historical skills that, that, are, that we have already developed, they still apply. And we can evaluate and explore all of these kind of data questions in exactly the same way. And especially if we are not collecting the data ourselves and it has been given to us or we are taking it from this kind of pre-collected environment. So with all of that in mind, you know, the source criticism and data as non-natural captor, um, there are some questions to think about. Remembering that data collecting only comes after the data decisions have been made. Um, so it's also, to all, it's also important to make note of these choices and how they might impact analysis that we will do with this data further down the line. So there are two sort of groups of questions when we're thinking about data collection. One is the questions to ask of yourself as a researcher. So what data do you need? Uh, what format do you need this to be in? Um, and that can be whether you, what kind of document formats do you want it in a Word document? Do you want it in a CSV? Do you want it in something else? Um, but also what just in general, what kind of data are you interested in collecting? Is it letters? Is it records? Is it newspapers? Um, you might want to think about how much you need. And by this, we also mean total volume, but also what are your research boundaries, i.e. what years are you interested in collecting information about geographically, how might this span, what kind of people, um, and also how will you store it, and this again links back to how much do you need, if you've got quite a lot you need to think about how you will store it as well. And then the second group of questions is the questions you want to ask about the data, and some of these might not apply if you are creating your own data 
um, or if you're dealing with quite old sources that don't necessarily have limitations on it. But these are definitely important to bear in mind as we talk about web scraping for the rest of this lesson. Um, so do I need permissions when I'm collecting this data? Are there legal restrictions or implications? And are there specific referencing instructions? So especially if you're dealing with born digital data, you might need to think about, again, the steps that have gone into this, but how this might implicate <clears throat> how you reference or how you collect it. So this might seem like quite a lot of decisions and quite a lot of layers to think about, but the research process is a huge part of the eventual outcome. Um, so it's also important to just make note of this. Um, and to think carefully about how these kind of pre-decisions actually are a huge part of the initial method and the initial research process. So with that sort of, I hope, overview and general introduction to data decisions and data collection in mind, um, I'll now pass on to my colleague, Eliane, who will then talk more about web scraping as a process itself. So web scraping, as the name kind of suggests, is that you're on, the, on a website and you scrape away information kind of. So you literally, you and I will show you an example later on, you have a database and uh, most often, for example, today we're going to look at passenger lists. These are thousands of, of, of kind of pages where you have information about age, date, birth, whatever, of these people that traveled and wanting to copy paste that one after each other or also just copying it by hand that would take a long time and and is also a bit boring to do actually so this is where it's cool that you can actually download um information from a website directly and have this be done for you actually um so that's also the demo that lena will give later on but just as a short definition basically it is downloading and processing data from the internet and um, so you interact with the data that you can find on a website that is available online. And most often um, the language that you can see this done in, so in the back end of the website, it's called HTML. And um, below you can see a short example what HTML actually does. And the definition of HTML is, or well, it's an acronym, it's hypertext markup language. So it's really just a language that you have to um, kind of learn as well. So basically what you have in an HTML format, and I will give you the proper example later on, maybe some people already know this, um, then it's maybe a bit of a repetition, but anyways, um, you always have these tags um, in these brackets and everything that's in these brackets um, tells the computer kind of, or the website, what it should do. So first we have the information that it's a body of text and H1, for example, is then always a heading number one. So the size of the heading will also change. And P is for paragraph. So that's the very, very basic um, setup of a website. Um, so this website would only show you first heading, first paragraph and so forth. It can do much more. But now um, maybe Kelly, you can show the link of the website that we're using. Um, I can also paste this, I think, in the um, in the chat, so you can also all access this. Um, just a second. I hope you can access this. Now I'll share my screen. So now this is the website that we're going to be working with today. Um, and it's actually um, the, our, the Canadian archives that have digitalized a lot of, or digitized a lot of things. Um, and it's basically these passenger lists down here. So if we go back, so we have the Library and Archives of Canada. They have a lot of census data as well. Um, and they also explain how they prepare these this information, which is interesting to look at as well. Um, then if we go in deeper, we have passenger lists, which is what is interesting for us today. So many Europeans went to Canada between 1865 and 1922, and they recorded this here in more or less um, broad in a broad sense. Um, and so 
also this again, like uh, Caitlin before explained, it tells you what the data contains. So they have the name of the ship, ports and dates of departure. Um, here you can see more information about what the database actually consists. And like this database provides access to 21,840 references to passenger lists. So thinking about working through this manually is quite daunting, um, which is why we're giving you this example. And then there's also how you can search if you just want to look for specific families and so forth. It tells you how to do all this. Um, and now to give you a concrete example, here we have the passenger list of the Armenia, so that's the boat arriving in Montreal. Um, and you can see uh, the different information down here already written out for you and a picture of what exactly these looked like originally. And also the nice thing about um, having uh, it already digitized for you is that it's pretty difficult to read here. And um, if you look at the data later on, so that will, is Lena who's going to show that you will have it all written out nicely, um, typed out. So that's pretty cool. Um, and so, oh yeah. If we look here at page number four, we have an interesting case actually that will, um, it's here, this family, the um, Balabuk family. Um, and this is where you have to be, pay attention also to the data you're working with. So they have Aranus arrival dates actually in the digitized version. They departed from Hamburg in 1897 and arrived in Montreal in 1897. Again, same year because it took a couple of weeks. But in the digitized version, actually, um, they wrote, the person that digitized it wrote that it's, they arrive in 1910, which would make it pretty long travel. So they would have been on the road for, or on the ship for 13 years. Uh, so this is the moment where we noticed that, okay, it's not, you cannot take it at face value. So as with all sources that we're working with as historians, you need to be critical of what you're working with and think about the things that you're looking at and not just think, okay, this is a trigger. Everything's going to be true that I'm looking at. So um, that's just one of the examples that show well um, what data can give you, but how you also need to be um, kind of awake and, and think along. So um, what I was actually going to do is show you um, how what HTML look, looks like and how you can inspect, that's what you call it, a website. Um, if we take this picture here, that won't be that interesting. So we're going back to the other page. Um, there we go. If you right click and maybe you can follow this and I will give you some time afterwards to play around with this a bit as well. You can click on the inspect button. Do you see this on the screen actually, or does it not show? Okay, I'll just take that as a, as a yes. Cool, so if you click on the inspect button on the right side, this chart here pops up. And as you notice, if I move up and down, the different elements of the website pop up. So you see that this part is obviously called a selection, a uh, section. And here um, we see again the H1 that I talked about before. So you see how these tags work actually, and that we can move either like this to see what part highlights. We can also go up and down and see how this whole code works. It looks a bit scary in the beginning, but actually it's also pretty fun to play around and see body we had in the in the example before as well, to see how this is all set up. And then you notice that it's actually not that scary at all. Um, and then if you click on this button in the top right corner, you can also see the other way around. So you can go on the element on the website and see which part lights up. So obviously this is an image, it's also marked as an image. I'm now also giving you um, a list, uh, another website, and I'll post it in the Zoom. Um, is that second, where did it go? Um, because then you can actually see what all these things stand for. I'm having a problem accessing the chat. I'm sorry about that. Oh, there we go. So with this website, you can actually see the abbreviations of all these tags. So maybe you can put them side by side and you can either use this website actually and look at um, the HTML of the website or you can choose any other site. You could also look at your university website, whichever, uh, whatever interests you and you can try and see which parts of a website correspond 
to the HTML and just kind of get a bit familiar with this. And also if you want to look at the meanings of the tags and maybe we can do this for about five minutes just to get a bit of a feeling. And, we'll, and you can ask questions anytime either, um, as Martin said, either via group chat or you can kind of call us as well. So we'll be around. Я сподіваюся, зрозумів, що у нас трошки інтерактиву, да? тобто відео, звичайно, буде в записі, але я закликаю вас спробувати відкрити будь-яку сторінку в вашому браузері, можливо, одну з тих, що пропонувала лекторка, або будь-яку іншу, і спробувати зайти в режим інспектора, і спробувати поклацати цю розмітку, як вона виглядає, а потім вони вже пояснять, що з нею далі робити. Um, there is also another way, I don't know if it works the same way in, in, in every browser, um, to get to the inspector. This is when you uh, go to, to the settings of your browser, then on more tools on, and on web developer tools, then the same window will open on the right side. How's it going? Any success? As I remember, most of you are using a Chrome browser, so it's maybe a little bit tricky because of the green interface. So, and uh, this this web interface, just a second, uh, it's called Pervert in Ukrainian. So a right click and then the. Can you see? Yeah, that looks right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no. 
I find the the function in my Firefox it is easy <laughs> to find. <laughs> right click, no problem. Be great. Cool. Maybe it yeah, should just can... a kind of short um, moment to. to look at the things a bit yourself and not just make us lecture you all the time yeah. but actually um lena will continue to give you concrete examples of what actually happens behind all this okay so now it's my turn yes, yes. i'm going to share my screen now i need this screen okay can you see it already yeah. Okay. So um, as I've mentioned in the, in the chat, um, uh, what Eliane has just shown us uh, was the, the passenger list database with the scanned images, but the uh, Canadian archives, they have actually um, digitized all of that and parsed all of the data that was available on those scanned images into a database that you can search. So um, it's, a, it's a database of Ukrainian immigrants specifically. So not just everyone who, who um, immigrated to Canada, but um, they, they have a, a special collection of the Ukrainian immigrants database. And this database was um, originally um, created uh, for mostly for, for the purpose of people interested in the family history so for example if you um yeah if you search the database uh you can look for a family name and um i've been looking for for the uh, for variants of the family name of your teacher and it will just output similar sounding family names and you can check if if those people are maybe related to your own family and find out about your family history so this is what um uh, what this, this database is for and what it looks like. Um, and this also has to do with some of the limitations that it has. So you can then go um, onto the individual uh, entries and then you can see all of that information that was also available on the passenger list um, in, in this database uh, nicely uh, written out for you and perfectly readable. So what we are going to do now is see how we actually can get this uh, all this information via web scraping. And I'm going to show you this, um, um, this, this script that I wrote uh, in the form of a Jupyter notebook. So don't be freaked out by, by any stuff that, um, that's not yet familiar. I'm not going to go through the code in detail, but just explain the principles of how you, um, how you would go about um, that's quite a big page, uh, just important parts. So I'll be, I'll be focusing on two important aspects that you need to know, especially if you are web scraping multiple pages. So no, not just one page. Um, that's basically, yeah, you could also type yourself. You can just copy paste one page is not that much of an effort, but if you're scraping like um, a thousand or, or 10,000 pages, then it kind of makes sense to do this automatically. Um, and what we are going to do is um, first scraping this database based on the search um, of immigration year 191 asterisk. So that gives us all of the entries of passenger lists um, who immigrated from 1910 to 1919. And um, yeah. So that's quite a lot of results. It's um, 1,730 results. And we are going to get to every one of those pages, so first, second, and so on. It's not just four, it's actually quite quite a lot more. Uh, and scrape all of that data at once. And how are we going to do this? So the first important step is to have a look at how the URL actually looks like. So it's really important to... Um, to understand um, the structure of the URL because you're scraping multiple pages. So if you look at the very first one, um, the one, um, the page when you go in one, um, you can see that 
uh, it has a zero at the end. So there is one part of the URL which does not change. And then there's a second part of the URL which changes when you move from one page to the next, showing the first 30 entries, then the, the next 30 entries, then the next 30 entries, and so on, always 30 entries at a time. And you cannot change those settings on the on the website. They are pre preset for you. Um, so that's the only way that you can navigate the site. Um, and important also is the last page. So if you go to, to next, 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 um, you're getting to the last page. Um, there, the number is 1,710. And there, that, that will show you the last entries uh, for, for our search. So what you would do um, in Python with web scraping is then um, constructing your, your URL. You would be, um, you would be using the static part of the URL and adding all those numbers that you need at the end. So what you will first do, you will create a list of all the numbers that you need. So you 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 start with one, and you end with uh, with the last one, one thousand seven hundred ten, and you go in steps of thirty. And this will give you a list of all the numbers that you need need to visit. Um, so you insert that list into um, into your scraping code you're you're requesting the site and then you're, uh, you you're also indicating that at the end of um, each run you're going to change um the the tail of the url so that your code is going to visit every page um at a time one after another so i've done this uh, for the first five as a test so the first five pages, and, and this one just gives you like a preview if your code has worked, if like this, this first setting, the head of your code has worked, and uh, your code is actually going to, to the right pages if the, if the construction, the setting together of the URL has worked and it looks fine. So it, uh, the output um, looks exactly as we want it. So per, page one looks right, page two, three, four, five, they all look good. That is the first part. Um, what we're then going to do is um, we are creating kind of an empty container for the data that we want to scrape. So um, we are um, we're, we're giving those empty headers to um, to all the items that we want to to have in our table later. So it's basically the headers of what we have. Um, on the website, so it's the item number, surname, given name, age, ship, and year of immigration. And all of that is just like an empty um, placeholder for the data where it's going to, um, to be put in later. Then the important part is the scraping code itself. The first part I've already um, tested above. That's the same as here. So that's defining the URL page. Um, and the second part is the actual scraping code. So this has to do what Eliana has um, explained in the previous uh, section. So here you, you're actually going to have a look at um, the HTML and you need to discover whether the table row content is located. And then within the table rows, you need to see where the table data is located because that is the information that you uh, in the end that's what you want to grab from the website and store in a table um, and this is what I've defined here uh, for for all of those those items and I'm appending them to the contain to the empty containers that I've created at the beginning so I'm putting all the data uh, into those containers at every run. And I'm sleeping my code, so I'm pausing the code, the code for for ten seconds every time I'm going to a new page, and I'm doing this because, as Caitlin mentioned before, there's um, it's kind of the nice thing to do. So when you're writing scraping code, um, and you you're creating automate automate download, you're stressing the server, especially if you are doing this, um, yeah, if you're doing this with, with multiple records, or um, if, if I would give um, you the code of, uh, of my um, web scraping text, and you would all run this at once, 
then um, the site would be stressed. So that's really not, not, uh, not good for the service. So the nice thing to do is have a look at the robots text file of that particular website. And usually every website has, um, has a robots text file. Um, so if you go to the main page of the site, not any subfolders or so on, and, and type in robots text, it will um, direct you to a site that looks like this. And this will usually show you what restrictions there are for crawlers and spiders and, and all kinds of robots. So if there is a user agent with an asterisk, that means that refers to everyone. So also you, if you're trying to web scrape, that, that's what, uh, what refers to you. So you're not allowed to visit any of those pages. Websites are usually, they, they also have like sensitive information about um, who created the website, the people who work at the organization and so on. And robots like um, Googlebot and Yahoobot and so on. So they're not allowed to just grab that information. And this is um, this is the place where websites can indicate this, um, this kind of restrictions. And it also indicates for us that we should be using a crawl delay of 10 seconds. So I've, um, I've included this crawl delay uh, in here. So I'm, I'm saying between pages that I visit, uh, my code is going to sleep for 10 seconds and then it's going to continue. But you have to consider this because this makes um, the whole process running a bit longer. Okay, so this was the robots text. Um, now we're going back to um, our script. So we have visited all the pages, we have gotten all the data that we wanted, and now we're putting it in a data frame. And this is the result that we are getting. So this is what I, uh, what I have. It's very, very similar to, um, to what I get from the database. So if I go to the first page again, yeah, it's exactly the same. So I've wrapped all that data and I've put it in a table. And I can then, um, yeah, have a look at the table a bit, um, see how many how many entries I have in every column, and I can export this on my computer and then have a CSV um, file of um, which I called uh, Ukrainian migrants. So I have this here, which I can then open in Excel or um, in wherever I like. Um, wait, 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 where is it all down? Here it is. Okay. So um, now I have this table, but we are not finished yet. So what we what we now have is a table that doesn't contain that much interesting information. So it has the surname, given name, and the ship, and so on, and the year of immigration. But actually, if you go into, into more detail on the individual entries, they have much more interesting information. They have stuff like religion, nationality, occupation, and so on. If people are married or not, if they are able to read and write, this is far more interesting um, to, um, to analyze, like, especially if you have a lot of data about a lot of people. So we also want to grab that kind of data, not just this table, but every individual entry in this database. And this is going to be a bit more tricky. Um, and this, this what we are going to do is called like, uh, is, is called actually spidering. We are going to do manual spidering. So we are reaching into one side and then we are grabbing all the links that go from that side to other sides as well. And this is how we're going to do this. So we already have our first table and now we're looking at the, um, at the URL of the individual entry pages. So they look slightly different. So they have this um, static part, which is up to here. And then if you go to the next page, um, oh, I'm going to add this here. So the, the second one, just what the only thing that changed is the number of the ID. So everything else remains the same. We just need the number. So now we know that everything we need to have for our scraping code is a list of numbers that contains all those IDs. And we already have that because we've scraped it before. We have the item numbers here. So what we are going to do, we are going to use our first list 
we are going to use this column item number, which contains all the numbers we need. And we are going to put them into a new list. This is our new URL tails. So they now contain all the numbers that we need to put at the end of our URL. This is what we're going to do. So this is basically exactly the same as we had in the previous example. We are constructing our URL from two different parts, a static part and a changing part, and we are getting all those individual entries. This is again a test for the first five um, websites that we're going to visit. And this time we're going to visit um, 1,713. So um, now we need to do uh, again, uh, create the empty containers. So the um, define the headings of, of, of our table and um, initialize them. And this I didn't do um, from like a first example, which I could have done like here. Um, so I, again, I need to do the work and go to, uh, go to the inspector, use the inspector and then find the entries here and find where the data is actually located. So this is what I'm going to be using in the scraping code. I'm going to use these DT tags and DD tags to actually grab that information. Um, there they are, D -D DT and DT. DT tags. So, um, but before I do that, I need to know how how many different uh, headers do I actually need? What kind of information is there? Because they are not all the same. Passenger lists they look different, and this I'm going to uh, to get from uh, from the website itself because it has that kind of information. Um, it has this general description about the database, who created it, what, what's the content. And here it has a description of what can be found, um, and sometimes not, not always, um, in, the, uh, in the individual entry, um, entry lists. So because I want to have the complete data, I, uh, yeah, I created um, empty containers for all of them, or most of them. Um, that I found interesting. Um, uh, and then created the scraping code for um, for the for the individual entries in exactly the same manner as I did for the first table. So the first part again of the code is defining the URL. It's going to sleep every 10 seconds after every run. And then there is the code that scrapes the uh, the given names, the surnames, the age, and so on. Also, a very important part of it is always defining, um, uh, telling, uh, or defining in your code when what to do if your code doesn't find the information here on, on, on one particular page. So you always have to account for missing data, as Caitlin explained. So uh, if you don't have, like, um, marital status or able to read uh, information for one particular passenger, you need to make sure in your code that you, uh, you, you can still go on and grab other data. Otherwise, your code will be broken and you will be stuck and uh, it doesn't continue. So that's why this else and dot is in the code as well. Then you're doing the same as before. Um, you're just putting all that information in the data frame. And what you get at the end is a nice, beautiful table with all the information, but not just the first page. So all the um, all the information that you can have. So departure date, the destination, marital status, able to read and write, occupation, everything you had for every single passenger. Um, and we have that for 1,713 people. The, Last thing that I'm going to show before I, uh, I turn over to Eliane um, has to do with the quality of the data itself. Uh, so in this particular data set, when you look at the, um, at the columns as a whole, for example, at the column that has all the information about occupation, you can see that um, whoever created the database or the original people who um, who do who did it by hand um, they used sometimes very similar terms for very very similar things but they put it um, in different categories so in your database you're going to have um, um, 
columns that you need to kind of merge, um, but you also need to be very careful about this. So um, for example, I merged in this uh, data set, farm laborer and farm mm -hmm. laborer when they're written, when, when it's obviously just a typo. So that makes much more sense if you're looking at statistics later on, if you combine those categories, which are obviously um, the same thing. So you get like a proper statistical uh, analysis um, for, from that data. But you also need to be very careful um, then what, what to merge and what not to merge, because um, this is the 19th century um, or yeah, the beginning of the 20th century. You can't be a entirely sure if some of those categories are really the same. So for example, I wasn't quite sure if a farmhand and a farm laborer in 1910 was exactly the same profession or the same occupation. Maybe the farmhand um, is just someone who, um, who comes occasionally and migrates and a farm laborer is someone who lives at the farm and gets more salary. You don't know that. So um, before you merge categories, um, you have to actually look at the the historical data and get some get some other historical sources and get a clue what those occupations actually meant what those terms meant for those people for their lives um but some yeah some of the typos i corrected and i created a new data set just to not uh, corrupt the original data set that i had and uh, also keep track of what changes I made to the original data so that um, there is a record of what I did and what was originally there. Um, yeah, and the merged um, columns, they, they look slightly different. So they show you that farm laborers is, is basically, you have more of them than, than anyone else in the data set. It gives you a more um, interesting overview, a more exact overview of what, uh, what you actually have in the data in the column. Same for dates. Um, and then same step, exporting to CSV. And that's all from my side. So if you have questions, you can ask them later, but now it's Eliana's turn. So now I'm going to take over again. So um, what Leonard showed is that in the end, you have a big table, a CSV table that you can do things with. And what are those things? Um, so ideally, you can then analyze them, work with them, write a text and so forth. But you can also um, either, of course, in Python, do graphs and things. But there's also this website called Raw Graphs. Um, I will also put that in uh, the chat right now. Um, there we go. And it helps you make graphs and other visualizations. Um, so if I share my screen again, there we go. There. Um, then we actually have the CSV file. It's going to, my zoom is in the way there. Um, so we have the CSV file that you can just on this website, it's very easy to use. Um, you can upload your data here and you can just drag and drop the CSV file. So here we have exactly what then was talking about before you have the information as your name, surname, and so forth. Um, and in the end, you also have the corrected information um, that they not talked about. So the proper dates, because if you see here, the program actually sees that you're have that it's having trouble because in, for example, row 14, there is an error that it doesn't appreciate. Or later on, you can see. Hmm, can't see when I'm scrolling down, but sometimes there are the dates that it doesn't, oh wait, sorry, of course we're over here. Um, there we go, row 14, see it doesn't take 1910, um, but it should of course be 1910. And instead of manually going to correct that, Lena did that step beforehand and we here have the corrected data. We just need to keep this in mind because if we're going down now to make these graphs, and you can see there are so many different things you can do, depending on what kind of data you have. It's good to do just a simple bar chart or a pie chart. But then there's also these more complex things that sometimes are just plain fancy, but it's also fun to play around with. And sometimes they actually really help you um, make something meanif meaningful. And for this example, I will show you the matrix plot because it actually looks pretty, pretty neat um, and what it can show you. And there, also, again, this program shows you very clearly what you're doing with your data, how you want to show it. Um, and so here I want to look at the occupations 
in connection also to H. So for my X axis, then I choose, um, sorry, I have to move the things around on my screen a bit. Um, there we go. Um, so for my X axis, I choose H. For my Y axis, I want to look at occupation. Um, if it will drop in here, exactly. And then, the size, you need to choose the, the size of the data that you're working with before we also talked about the item numbers. So I'm going to put that in here. There we go. And later on, you'll see what color is um, necessary. And for the color, I also choose um, the occupation. Again, you can put in any kind of information you want in here. You can choose any kind of graph you want in here to play around with to show what kind of meaningful visualization can you have with the data that you have with the uh, argument that you also want to make because of course the data that you're using and how you're showing it this is all part of of making an argument right so this is not just facts of course it's facts that you're working with but the way you present them um also uh, your your storytelling basically as well so you need to keep that in mind as well um so here this now created this matrix um graph but it doesn't really help you that much yet. And you see there's all these customizations that you can make on the side and it takes doesn't take a long time to get familiar with this, but still worth looking at it a bit more closely. So for example, you can say you want the legend to show here. So you would have it on the side again. It's not so useful because you have them on this side already as well. So we don't really want to show the legend. You can make the margins on the side a bit bigger. So so it moves a bit more to the center. For example, you can play around with all these things, uh, but important for us is now that you can see that here, these numbers are all jumbled. And you would think that it would work if you use total value ascending, but somehow the database and the system doesn't really work together in that sense. And if you play around a bit, you see that if you take the name as a value up here, that it will count properly, although there's a little glitch here. Um, we need to figure out why that is. Um, so as always, you need to stay aware and, and kind of play around until things work. Um, then for the colors, this is all a bit bland and doesn't tell you too much yet. So it's better to use a discrete system and I choose this one. And then you can see there are all these colors that coordinate to um, the occupation. So you can also see, because we chose size before of the item numbers that you see how many kind of entries you have. So then they're bigger or smaller, these little boxes, and then they correspond, the colors con correspond to the job. So that's why every line has a different color. And you see here what Lena mentioned also, now we have a bunch of laborers um, because this doesn't really show, we don't see what kind of labor before. So we would have to adjust that as well. Um, but basically why I'm showing this website is because it's a very nice way to play around with your data, to see what your data can show to, and it's in, it's also a very straightforward way to get nice graphs because you could, as I said before, choose any kind of, um, you can also do a linear dendrogram and then put in all kinds of things to um, just basically, I'm just gonna throw stuff in here. Maybe it will work, maybe not, I don't know. Um, so we have the hierarchy of departure port, label destination, probably now it won't do much yet or it's not very interesting at least because we have this starting point, but just to show you, you can do a lot of things and maybe this is a, a good moment for you again to do some hands-on work and play around with this a bit. Um, there. So um, I'm trying to share the data with you maybe so that you can also um, play around and see what actually this website does and how you can use the data that we now have this massive set um, to, to make these different graphs. Jana, maybe you can share the 50 entry set if you still have it. I have the 51, then that's a bit faster. Also, yeah, if you have a really big data set and you're using this program, sometimes it can take a while for it to calculate everything. Um, so I have the... This one, this, so this is the data set that Lena created as a test first. Um, 
And you will see that probably it has a, an error if you put it in the, because we haven't corrected in there the, the departure date. So you can just put in random numbers um, of the dates so it will work. Um, but yeah, so it, because it's smaller, it will be easier to play around with. Of course, if you have a bigger data set, you will have more conclusive um, an answers kind of for tables that it will give you, but this is starting point. So yeah, so I invite you all to um, play around with the graphs and the data set a bit. And again, just um, call us if you have any questions. Thank you, uh, folks. I encourage you to ask all the kinds of questions that you have. There are no simple questions or dumb questions. You can ask whenever you want to. <laughs> yeah, uh, because it's really a unique opportunity for you. You're welcome. I may start with a very simple question about, uh, you, you mentioned this critical approach, because for, for, for every niche historian, it's clear that source and data is something that uh, requires this critical approach. We need to be critical while uh, looking through our data. Um, but probably there are some features while working with uh, digital data, something that differs from you know working with old manuscripts. Um, any notions, any uh, comments on this? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to comment on that. I think it's uh it's it's certainly uh, an interesting one and sometimes it's really easy to uh sort of backpedal and give that kind of source criticism. So for example, I work with uh metadata that's taken from archives, so I can at least go and look at the archives and sort of get more uh information from there and maybe compare and contrast and say some of this uh so for example with the missing data some of this is missing because it's not been selected to be digitized and some of this is missing because it never existed or it was destroyed in the 16th century so it, it would never have made it to digitization um but i think what's really important is um as uh Eliane showed in for example, with this uh, Ukrainian immigrant data set, that they have tried their best to document what is and isn't included. So some of it comes from best practice on the researcher's point of view to try and find out what is and isn't there. And to um, if you don't necessarily have all of that information, to at least acknowledge that you don't have that information and you've done your best in trying to find it. But a lot of it comes, a lot of the responsibility is also on those creating digital data and digital sources to explicitly acknowledge where they have found it, what they have done with it. Um, and sometimes this can be quite new for historians, because if you read a traditional history book, they won't sit there and say, oh, well, I went to this archive and I looked in this box and I found this information. Um, so I think we're not used to doing that, but actually it's really, really important to be doing it. So when you're writing essays as well, to think about where you found this data from and to acknowledge where it's come from. Um, so, you know, digital history is, we're, we're still building best practice. Um, so not everyone is, is critically thinking about it in the same way. Um, but it's really, really important that when you come across something online, or you web scrape something and you bring it in to think critically about why have you chosen this website to get your data from? Who has put this data somewhere? Are they being funded by a certain body that is asking for certain information? And therefore they're just certainly looking for some kind of records and not either. Um, so yeah, there's, there's not, really yet best practice or not really a clear answer as to how you can go into these things. But I would recommend, or I would at least say that uh, keeping your keeping your eyes open and looking for all the information and making note of what is and isn't there and thinking really critically about it is probably the best way to go. But that's just my two cents. Uh, I've also added a link to the chat um, now that's also a website. Yeah, it's um, amazing, yeah. Have you, uh, are you already familiar with that? I tried it, yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. 
so that's basically a website that um that teaches you uh, like you can, can do it in self study to um to look at the like the critical the pain points of doing digital source criticism so it goes through the comparison of how is a collection of letters different from a collection of emails and what um how does the metadata change so it it tries to teach you to be aware of those things that not just because the the stuff is is now digital or digitized you uh, you should um, be less careful with your footnotes, with uh, with uh, with uh, caring about who created this, why, uh, with what money, and for for what purpose, for what audience, and and so on and so on. Uh, there was a question in the chat about how to, uh, as I understand, uh, what to do if the information is not uh, digitalized properly. Uh, the scanned uh, scanned pages, scanned pictures. Uh, as I understand, it's. Uh, can we download uh, the image? Yes, Ivan. Uh, well, the question was like, if the image is digitalized, then we can uh, extract met metadata from it. So it's useful for us. But if it's just digitized, so it's just a scanned page, then what exactly can we extract from it? I think Caitlin has um, a lot of information to share about this because that's a problem she's struggling with. <laughs> yeah, so digitized versus digitalized is something I struggle with a lot. Um, so obviously there's essentially the, the bonuses of having something digitized where it's just a scanned image is it means if that archive is in a different country or it's a private archive or you have to pay for it in any way, um, you can access it from anywhere around the world, but it isn't a digital copy. You don't have metadata. You can't immediately start doing digital analysis with this. Um, so if you can, if you're good at transcription or anything like that, it means you can then have a local copy, something on your computer that you can download and you can work with, but yes, Digitized material, so just having an image online, doesn't immediately mean you can do digital analysis with it. Um, so there, there is that extra step of digitalizing material to allow you to start doing this kind of um, digital analysis and digital criticism. And, and, and as I said earlier, start applying it to graphs and stuff. So it is important to be careful that having digitized material is fantastic. It means there's a lot more access to material that you can work with and it doesn't matter where that material came from in, in the sense that it doesn't matter where the material sits right now because you can access it and that's fantastic but there are still levels of you know what parts of that record have or haven't been digitized what's the quality like because sometimes you get really poor quality digitizations um, but yeah it's a really important question that there is only a limit to what kind of digital analysis you can do when it's only an image. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Yes. There's also like another um, yeah, side to it. Um, if you have digitized images only, um, it can still be kind of interesting for for some research uh, questions for look at for looking at layouts so there's there's all kinds of analysis that you can do with images and parsing the layout of, of particular sites so for example if you had um a, a collection of um, digitized newspapers and you would be interesting to, in the arrangement of advertisement on that page or the sizes of advertisement on that particular page you would also learn about how much money did those people pay um, for their advertisement to be that to to cover that much space on newspaper. So there is still even with images, um, and I've, I've seen this uh, kind of research done um, by colleagues. You can still do some very interesting stuff. So it's not always the, the 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 extracted text content that's super interesting. You can you can also do all kinds of things um, with digitized data. There was uh, there was also a very interesting insight about all these farmers, different types of farmers, in this uh, table, and it's really an example that um, 
digital history is not just about uh, scripting. You need to be aware of what are you doing and you need to be uh, familiar with your sources. You need to understand what exactly this data, data is about. about what. Um, maybe this is a question pro of you uh, about your way to the digital history, uh, how this interest uh, emerged. It was a practical need to start practicing digital history or some other reasons. Maybe I can jump in first here because um, I only recently asked myself that question because, as I said, I started a year ago and I do not have a digital history background at all. Um, I studied at University of Zurich. They're pretty old school. Um, so when I applied for the University of Luxembourg and I saw that there was, and of course, I already knew of the digital history department. I thought, well, this sounds like because I have worked with. Um, online material and thought, well, it would be very important to know more about this. And I think it is actually really cool that you're also giving this course to see um, what it actually means to do digital history or work digitally as well, because it often seems quite scary. And I was super, um, I was thinking this is quite a leap that I applied here because uh, I just knew very, very little coding. And now this year I also took coding classes. Um, and it can seem, maybe all of you already are Python coders, I don't know, but it can seem very scary in the beginning. And I thought, okay, I will never understand this and why I can just read stuff and I'll get there eventually. Um, but it gives you different ways of looking at your data, as you said before, uh, with these farmers. Um, it's not that if you have things on a big data set and do some graphs that, ta-da, you, you have to think less not at all. I think it actually makes you be even more critical of the data you're working with because you have much more. You need to kind of somehow have to deal with all of this and then make kind of shrink it down again to create some kind of meaningful information to pass on. So uh, now to answer your question, how did I get to digital? It's, it was more of a general interest because our world world is... Um, ever more becoming internet focused, for example. And it's super important, I think, that we have access to digital archives so that, um, well, a much broader set of people can work with a much broader set of information. Um, so I think it's just a general moving forward and combining the, the old um, kind of tools of a historian, but adapting it to the times. Um, and I, I can speak to my experience. I was a traditional historian right up to the start of my PhD. Um, but in my master's uh, studies, I sort of manually recreated um, a, a letter network or I sort of hypothesized about the existence of a letter network about this one minister in, in England in, during the Tudor period and wrote my master's thesis on it and was really interested and then sort of discovered through wider reading that people were working on uh, computational and quantitative means of analyzing this, this network. Um, so uh, I, my supervisor was working on the digitized or well, digitalized metadata of the state paper archives in England. So I, I joined with her to sort of transform my, my master's hypothesis into a uh, digitalized uh, experiment and using digital network analysis to explore uh, sort of traditional questions. So my interest has been, there are certain periods of history where people sort of say, oh, this this has been done, we found out everything we can. And I like adopting new methods, as Eliane says, new methods in, in history to explore sort of traditional questions of power and influence and, and connection and found out these kind of things. Um, so yeah, so I come from a very, very traditional history background moving into sort of digital methods to just kind of look at the same questions. So new frameworks um, of understanding um, but yeah, it's been uh, it's been exciting to, to move into new ways to approach the same questions for me. There is a question about legal issues. <laughs> uh, 
also I've just seen the the question in the chat um that says a lot of digital or digitalized archives and libraries hide their contents behind a paywall um is it a true detriment towards data searching or or, or a me problem that I've blown out of proportion absolutely not um this is a, a huge problem um and in fact something uh actually the 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 archives I work with are behind a paywall so I completely empathize with this um it's uh that there's kind of like two modes there are some we understand that um a lot of places have to earn money somehow or they want to protect that the fact that this is intellectual property and if you publish it open access especially data there's not really best practice in the humanities yet about acknowledging data collection and data creation and all of these kind of things about acknowledging that as a publication or academic labor. So there's still some issues around that going on and, and best practice still isn't developing. But also a lot of people uh, are trying to move towards this kind of open access idea of digitalization and digitization. Because as you say, with, with some archives and libraries, if you went in person, it would be free. So why is there this issue about suddenly the digitized version um, being behind a paywall. Um, so it is a big problem. And, uh, but I think especially events of recent years with um, sort of um, COVID lockdowns and things like that, more places are trying to make stuff open access because there's this acknowledgement that having greater access and open access is really fantastic for historical research. So it is a big problem, but fingers crossed as sort of more digital archives are created and used, maybe we'll have more open access coming in the future. So fingers crossed. Thank uh, you. May, uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Sure, go ahead. And if we are talking about, not only about the digital archives, but about some services that provide uh, scientific literature for free, like for example, uh, for example, uh, Library Genesis or Skyhub, uh, what's, your, what's your opinion on this one? Uh, personally, I'm all for open access. I think it's fantastic. I, uh, I, I think I think it's great as long as uh, due reference is given. Um, so if you read someone's paper and you use it in your work, as long as that, as long as academic labor is acknowledged, and you know the right footnotes and the right referencing is given for me i think open access is is a great thing i think it's fantastic um both for um early researchers but also researchers who might not be working in academia at the, at the moment so um their institution might hold logins to these these articles and these data but if you're outside of it and you just want to read this work for fun i think it's great to have it open access but but that's but that's me i don't know um if Lena and Eliane have, have other thoughts. Thank you. I think it's also a bit of a political question again and with the rights and so forth, but as Caitlin said, I think it's important if you use open access material to, um, as she said, acknowledge who did that work, because I think that's the most important thing to acknowledge who did the original work, uh, but also this personal opinion, I think, it, the more that you can access openly the and the more things are not connected to institutions with money uh, it's kind of a democratizing thought of course then the more people can actually do proper research and it's always I think a shame if uh, the work that you can do um, is connected to the money that you have out of whatever circumstances so that's why I am very much pro um, open access again as Kevin said if you're not connected either if you're connected to a university that does not have a lot of money so it does not have a lot of rights to ac access these websites that shouldn't be that way and also if you're just a person in general from whatever background who wants to look at these things this should be possible Uh, one yes, question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So, uh, like the method of the uh, web scraping, yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so uh, that is 
when the code is uh, requesting the data from the website. Yeah. So uh, what other I think code methods, let's say, like using code uh, to process the process the data or what we can do more, like just coding Python, using Python, for example. Oh, there. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question, and uh, it requires a like a <laughs> book of an answer. <laughs> There's so much that you could do depending really on the on the state the data is in or the state you, the data you you put it in. Um, so now we have been looking at um, a table data. But if you, for example, if you if we find online a collection of texts, um, or literary texts, um, or historical texts, or that kind of stuff, you can also um, use initially use web scraping to collect those texts and then using completely different methods to to analyze text there's different methods for analyzing table data and text also different methods for analyzing images and texts um, if the if the data is suitable um, you could do um, network analysis but you kind of need to already know know in advance if um, if that makes sense uh, in in this case or not. So, for example, um, with uh, with the data that we scraped from this website, you could theoretically do like a, um, create a network from um, departure port, arrival port, but that's not not a particularly interesting network. So there might be better examples that you can find out there where network analysis really makes sense as a method, where the connections are really meaningful. So if, you, if you're really just studying um, um, ship lines and the network of ship lines around the world at the time, then maybe that data kind of is interesting for you for network analysis, but um, uh, for many cases, it would be not. So it really depends of, um, of, of the data. Um, and your research questions, so your, the, re, uh, the the interest that you have in this data. Um, yeah, the purpose. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, the method depends uh, depends on the purpose of uh, uh, your research. Yeah. So web scraping in this uh, example that we presented was just kind of a first step. It, you can use it for for many kinds of data. Um, when that uh, when when the data format is suitable you can do topic modeling with text if you have text sources you can do network analysis if you have a very very suitable data set that has interesting uh, relationship connections uh, in it uh, you can you can do geospatial analysis that's uh, it's more the kind of, uh, of work that eliana is doing if you have um, very interesting uh, data that has uh, connections of locality and information, uh, where you can where you can combine the information that you have about territory with information that you have in a in a data set. And yeah, so it really depends. Yeah, thank you. I put two links in the in the chat. Um, the the humanities data analysis is a. As Lena said, you could fill a book. So this is actually an online open access book uh, where there are also exercises that you can do. Um, it, I find it, for at least for me, who do, doesn't have too much experience, I find it quite advanced, but it helps you reading the chapters and you can also click on them individually to just know what there is, what things you can do. Um, there's also textual analysis in there, topic modeling and so forth. So you just see, you see what is out there. And then I can very much recommend this website, Python Humanities. We'll also share our slides with you later on. The link is also there. Um, Python Humanities has these very, very basic introduction classes to Python, and it makes you feel comfortable using Python and doing these very easy tasks. There's also one on web scraping, actually. Um, but later on, there's also more specific courses that if you want to do spatial analysis, you can uh, follow these tutorials as well and they're really quite helpful and very well made so i recommend that also just to get an overview i have a question <laughs> for um um we are almost at the end i think of the of this class so what um was this was our presentation different from the others or was it um what what else have you learned so i i have no idea um how how this how useful this was for you 
I hope it was useful. Uh, and if, if for me, it was uh, interesting. I hope for students too. Um, oh, yeah, we, we, we have some reflections. So, Anna. Well, yes. Uh, so before we listen to the lecture, we, at least, at least a part of us, we read some uh, literature about these topics and uh, seeing it all on practice was uh, kind of interesting and, and useful even. And if uh, we talk about in general, then we, we have just started learning this uh, type of digital history. So of course, of course, it was useful and interesting for everyone. I hope at least. Thank you. Uh, maybe from your experience, because, uh, you know, in Ukraine, we have this uh, practice uh, when uh, students are writing uh, the year paper. It's not a, a BA thesis, it's not a MA thesis. This year paper is uh, students of uh, second year, third year are writing for the, for the whole year, some kind of a, a big uh, research practice. And I, I, I have seen it uh, several times that uh, some second year students are very excited and encouraged with uh, new methods, uh, starting implementing it into their researches, uh, but they feel in some kind of um, rejection, uh, resistance from uh, uh, conservative colleagues, from old school historians saying that uh, uh, all these practices are not um, reliable methods. Uh, I understand that for you, work, uh, being a part of a center, it's not an issue, but maybe uh, you faced it once. Um, this <laughs> critic about uh, digital history is a method of analysis. We face it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Caitlin, maybe you want to share something. Yeah, I think especially, um, like, uh, for me personally, I think that the best benefits of digital humanities are not to operate in sort of this little bubble where we only ever talk to other digital humanists, because it just doesn't make sense. Um, and I think a lot of, a, a lot of us, maybe I'm, I'm maybe not, hopefully I'm speaking for some of you, that you come to digital history because you, or digital humanities, because you love the sort of the traditional or the conservative approaches, but want to sort of add an extra layer to it. And so because of that, you also want to go back and talk to these traditional colleagues and say, well, this is what I've learned. Um, and I, so I, you know, talk to more conservative people and I do get the, well, that and and what we get the so what and the and what question quite a lot about. But what is this bringing anything new? What's the point kind of thing? So yes, we face this question quite a lot. Um, but I think what's the, the best way to uh, to go about it is um, I don't know. To I like to try and encourage pe other people to join the digital history, uh, like a clan, and say, "But look, we are doing cool things with it, and this is we are still contributing to traditional narratives. And actually, this is something new we can bring, but not in an isolating way. Um, but yeah, so if you're coming across that kind of thing, that's perfectly normal. <laughs> like it's still happening. Um, but the best part is to just you know show everyone that it's fun and we can do cool stuff with it and to not do it in a way that's uh like we don't want to isolate ourselves from from more traditional historians as well so it's about just engaging and still talking to people about it and how much fun and good and like interesting stuff that we can still find so for sure yeah i think it, exactly that it's more of a it's a side by side. It's not one or the other. I think that's the problem. I think many, many traditionalists are a bit scared that this will overtake the traditional close reading work. But you still have to do, as we showed in the examples today, you have to do close reading. You are close to your sources. You're not letting go of that traditional cool history stuff. You're just enhancing it with other, it's just another method. So it should go side by side. And maybe it's good to explain that and not kind of pose a threat in that sense. And also all the things that Caitlin had in the introduction, being very, very um, careful about um, the, the limitations of your data um, is very crucial in, in not making arguments that, that you cannot uphold. So as we have seen yet with, with this example, um, 
with the with the passenger list it has some interesting information but it does not give us a full picture of the ukrainian migrants lives so we we only have like a, a few parameters a, a few um a few columns filled with some random numbers so if you if you're interested in statistical analysis or the uh, like the the degree of literacy of Ukrainian farmers at that time. Yeah, we can we can say something about that. But it's also important to be aware that we cannot say anything about anything else that's not in that data. Um, for if, if you want to have a more a more fuller understanding of what's what's going on, then we need the different sources. Maybe we want to consult um, some other materials, some more personal so sources, letters, for example, of those people writing back to, to the family's home, or for example, census data in Canada, so that, that we can match those different data sets. Then we get other interesting insights. You always have to be aware what your data is, what's in your data, what, what the arguments you can make and the arguments that you can't make. Yeah, we had a very interesting dispute about uh, digitizing of everything. Uh, but as for me, it's the same issue is is with traditional history, because <laughs> you cannot just take a look at everything. It's the same problem, and uh, it shouldn't be just uh, uh, something that only digital historians are dealing with. Uh, any more questions, Shivna Spitania? Yes, one more question in chat: Is it possible to use artificial intelligence in digital history? Liliana question. <laughs> She's our chat GPT expert. Yeah, I've been playing around a lot with chat GPT lately just because I find it very amusing. And the interesting thing also about chat GPT is that it pulls information from the internet, right? So if you take a very simple example, if you're searching for a recipe, we'll just jumble together the most common things that it finds and gives you kind of, uh, it subsumes what you have. But you have to be careful because if you ask it, for example, like I did for, I, I, I was uh, struggling with my paper and thinking, hmm, is there any more literature I can find? So I ask it, do you have information on uh, Marseille, the port, its park development and, and so forth? So I gave it some parameters and it gave me as an answer, the perfect book, which would make my research obsolete, but it's not true. So again, ChatGPT just took all the information that I gave it together and gave me an answer. That's what it does. So it's interesting to play around with. It's great if you're starting to code. Because that very basic, easy code, it can explain to you very, very clearly. So um, I would recommend it as a learning tool um, instead of using Stack Overflow or whatever. In the beginning, when you're coding, that can give you answers. But you need to be aware of the limits. Maybe in future, ChatGPT can help. Of course, there's also machine learning that you can use in more advanced code when you're doing topic modeling, for example, again, then things like machine learning, where you train your program to search for specific words, for example, then machine learning is great. Um, also, you need to be aware that you're giving the code, the parameters of what you want to search. So you uh, have responsibility for what's happening. Again, you're not letting go of your sources. You are working closely with your sources and you're responsible for what happens with them. So it's always a bit of the same thing. Um, so I am not against using these things at all. They can help you, but you need to be aware of what machine learning can do, what chat GPT can do, what its limits are, and you cannot become lazy. Unfortunately, you still have to stay on your toes. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I have a question. I, uh, I'm i recording this uh, lecture for uh, internal use for those students who are not with us today. Uh, but if you are not against, of, I would like to share it with colleagues and probably even publish it somewhere. Then I may share it with you. Uh, is it okay? You are totally in. Okay, then I will share the link with you. Uh, thank you a lot to being with us today to share all these insights. I... I hope it will be helpful. And it was really exciting and awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was really oh, yeah. Danke. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you.
Oh, and you can send us emails if you have more questions, of course. Oh, great. I will share it. Yes. Thank you for the lecture. Thanks. Have a nice day, everyone. Yeah. I will see the rest of you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.